One question that I'm often asked is, how do you prove the existence of God? How do you prove that the Bible is correct? How do you prove Jesus? And there's different ways to go about doing it. Me, I like to prove the Bible with the Bible. I like to prove God with the Bible. I like to prove Jesus with the Bible. But before I go into what I say, I want to go ahead and play a little bit of a clip from, I believe this is John Bevere, and I want you to listen. Now, we, I've said this in different ways, but he puts this together in a pretty good fashion. I like how he how he strings it together. I like what he says. I think you're going to enjoy it too. And then I'll come back and I'll share something else with you that also gives even more, I think, conclusive proof in the reliability of the Bible. Of the Bible. Written over a 1500 year time span. Do you understand how long 1500 years is? If I go back 1500 years from right now, we're at 515 AD. There hasn't even been a British Empire yet. That's a long time ago. Okay? 1500 years. 66 books are written by over 40 writers from three different continents in three different languages. We got kings, we got prisoners, we got soldiers, military men, we got shepherds, we got farmers, we got a physician, we got a tax collector who's a mafia guy. And you put all these guys' books together over 1,500 years. Now, many of them lived in different generations and don't know what the other guy wrote. You put them all together and you get a perfectly harmonized book. Do you know what that's like? That's like looking at 40 different writers over the last 1,500 years and saying, write a chapter of a novel, putting the whole thing together after 1,500 years and having it make any sense. But not only that, it gets even better. If you look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament's 39 books written over 1,100 years. And the last book of the Old Testament is written 400 years before Jesus is even born. I mean, go back 400 years from right now. There's no Atlanta Braves. You don't even have the Falcons yet. You don't have the United States. I mean, the pilgrims just got on the boat. That's a long time. The last book was written 400 years before Jesus was even born. Now, you got these 39 books written by all these different authors for over 1,100 years, many of them living in different generations, not knowing what the other guy wrote. And you know what these guys did? They made predictions about the Messiah. Things like he'd ride in Jerusalem on a donkey. He'd be betrayed by a friend. He'd be born in Bethlehem. He'd be called out of Egypt. He would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. He'd be crucified. And they made over 300 predictions. With the last one being made 400 years before Jesus was even born. And you know Jesus fulfilled all 300 of those predictions? So there's a scientist named Dr. Peter Stoner who has since gone to heaven. But... He was an expert in probability. Do you know what probability is? If I have a five-gallon paint bucket and I have nine white tennis balls and I have one yellow tennis ball and I shake them all up and I blindfold somebody and I say, reach in, grab one ball, the chance of picking out that one yellow tennis ball is one in ten. Well, he's an expert in this. So Dr. Stoner wants to know what is the probability that anybody can fulfill these prophecies. So he doesn't do the work himself. He employs 600 science students from 12 different classes. And they spent years of research. Not years, they spent months of research. The, Amer the National American Scientific Council reviewed their work and said not only was their work accurate, but it was conservative. So what I'm about to share with you is conservative. Please remember that. So they said, all right, what are the chances that any human being, from any human being in the world, from the time of the birth of Christ until the end of the second millennium, 2,000 years, could fulfill just eight of the prophecies? So here's the eight prophecies they chose. Christ, Christ to be born in Bethlehem. That's Micah wrote that. Christ to be preceded by a messenger. Isaiah and Malachi in different generations wrote that. Christ entered Jerusalem on a donkey. Zechariah in a totally different generation wrote that. Christ to be betrayed by a friend. The psalmist in a completely different generation wrote that. And there's the rest of the eight. They took those eight prophecies. Said, what's the chance any human being over 2,000 years could fulfill those eight prophecies? You know what the, after all their calculations, you know what the chances are? One in 10 to the 17th power. Now what in the world is that? 10 to the 17th is a one with 17 zeros behind it. I don't even know how to say that number. And I have an engineering degree. It's not gazillion billion. I got news for you. Okay, but I can illustrate that number. If I have that many silver dollars, I have no place on earth to store them. I have to just spread them out all over the ground. And if I do, if I have that many silver dollars and I spread them out all over the ground, I will cover the entire state of Texas two feet deep with those silver dollars. Now, gather them all in, mark one of the silver dollars, shuffle them all up, redistribute them all over Texas, blindfold a guy in Oklahoma, put him in a helicopter, start flying over Texas. Remember, it takes two days to drive through Texas. At any point he can say let down, then he gets out of the helicopter, still blindfolded, the chances of him picking up that one silver dollar 
is one in 10 to the 17th power, which means that is the chance that any human being could have fulfilled eight of those prophecies, yet Jesus fulfilled all eight prophecies. So Dr. Stoner said, what about 16 prophecies? So they do all these hours of calculation, he and the 600 science dudes. And they say that the chances any human being could have fulfilled 16 prophecies is one in 10 to the 45th power. That's a one with 45 zeros behind it. Don't even ask me to write that number down. Now, if I have that many silver dollars, I can't store them on the earth. It's too many. I've got to make a big ball of silver dollars. I've got to make a sphere of them, okay? You know how big this sphere would be? The diameter of that sphere would be 60 times the distance of the earth to the sun. If you want mileage, it's 5.5 billion miles. Now, mark one of those silver dollars. Shuffle them all up. Blindfold the guy. Put him in a jet plane. It will take 400 years nonstop flight just to fly around the ball. At any point, he can say, let down. Now, remember, he might have to dig 2.75 billion miles into the center because the mark one might be in the center. But the chance of him picking up that one silver dollar is 1 in 10 to the 45th power. That is the chances that any human being could have fulfilled 16 of the prophecies. Yet Jesus fulfilled all 16. So can I blow your mind? Can I really blow your mind one more time? Can I blow it? So Dr. Stoner said, what about 48 prophecies? What are the chances anybody could fulfill 48 prophecies? So they do hours and hours of calculations. And you know what they found out? It's 1 in 10 to the 157th power. Now, how big is that number? I can't use the silver dollar. It's too big. I got to go to a smaller item. I got to go to an electron. Now, do you know how small an electron is? Let me just tell you. If you got a one inch line of electrons, straight line, one inch, and I start counting tonight and I don't go to sleep. I will count, if I count 250 per minute, it'll take me 19 million years to count that one inch line of electrons. Now, if I have that many electrons, one in 10 to the 157 power, I gotta make a sphere of electrons. You know how big a sphere would be? It would be as far as man has ever seen into space. 13 billion light years. Now, mark one of those electrons. Blindfold the guy, put him in a space shuttle, send him into space. At any point, he can say stop. The chance of picking out that one marked electron is the chance that any human being could have fulfilled 48 of those prophecies. Yet Jesus fulfilled all 48. <laughs> so can we review here? Can we review? Okay, we got, we got 39 books written over 1,100 years by all these guys. That many of them don't even live in the same generation. They make these predictions about the Messiah with the last one being 400 years before he was even born. And Jesus fulfills all 300. And you tell me the Bible doesn't apply to today? If, you, if this doesn't do anything for you, man, and there are going to be folks that no amount of evidence, no amount of logic, no amount of proof is going to settle the, the, the fact for them. None, none, no amount. There are going to be those that are going to say, well, there are more books, they're lost, but they're going to have all these different answers. Listen, he only talked about 16. There's over 300 prophecies about Jesus. Now, there are even more prophecies that are not about Jesus. As a matter of fact, let me just pull up one prophecy that has nothing to do with Jesus has nothing to do with Israel. It's a historical fact. It is a proven fact. It's a prophecy that many skeptics have just scoffed at and said, well, it's so accurate that they must have written it after the fact. But we have archaeological proof, uh, historical facts, historical proof to show that this was written long before this actually happened. So let's go to Daniel chapter 11, starting in verse 2. Now I tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings are going to arise in Persia then a fourth will gain far more riches than all of them. As soon as he becomes strong through his riches, he will, ar he will arouse the whole empire against the realm of Greece and a mighty king will arise and he will rule with great authority and do as he pleases. Now, this I won't read the whole thing, but this particular prophecy in Daniel 11 is about Alexander the Great, his rise and his fall and that his kingdom will be broken up into four pieces. And as, as the Bible says, not to his posterity, meaning none of his descendants will inherit any of his kingdoms broken into four pieces. And so his four generals are going to take over. Now, there's also a story in here that speaks about how the king of the south and the king of the north are going to form an alliance. So in Daniel 5, it says, then the king of the south will grow strong along with one of his princes who will gain ascendancy over him and obtain dominion. His domain will be a great dominion indeed. After some, they will form an alliance and the daughter of the king of the south will come to the king of the north to carry out a peaceful arrangement, but she will not retain her position. Now, I won't read the whole thing. I'll let you guys go back and read it. But what, what happens is um, she gets cheated on. He gets a mistress. They have a baby. He puts the baby on the throne or the, the son won't be a baby, but the son is going to be uh, the heir to the throne, but she's not going to have it. She is going to kill the mistress or the, the new wife. He's, she's going to kill the baby or the son and the king and put her son on the throne. 
This reads like a modern day soap opera, but it's a fact. It happened. Uh, this is historical. And the and, and the doubters, the scoffers, the skeptics will say, well, this is too accurate that it must have been written after the fact, but it's not. And so just to show how insanely accurate the Bible is. Why? Because this is coming from God. God knows uh, what is going to happen. God is omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere at the same time. But when I say everywhere, I don't mean just here in America, in China, in South Africa, in Brazil. No, I'm not saying that he's just there all at the same time, but he's everywhere, meaning he's in the past, the present, and the future all at the same time. That's how big and awesome our God is. Now, I'm not a scientist, but I do know of a story of a particular scientist who was also a former skeptic of the Bible. As a matter of fact, he was an arch um, enemy of the Bible. He was a staunch critic, but he was a professor at a school and he had students who also disliked the Bible because he was a mathematician. They asked him to present a probability of, the, of God not being in existence. In other words, a probability of there not being a God. And so what he did was he started with the first thing, which is the probability that, that God created mankind. And so the first thing that he did was he decided that what is the probability of a human being being created by God? But in order to do that, he also had to think about the fact that there had to be, uh, or we had to consider the probability of a human being, a male also uh, there being a female counterpart and the probability of them two being able to come together and to reproduce another male or female, either way, another human being just like them. What's the probability of that being able to happen? Well, in order for there to be a uh, offspring, then they have to live in a suitable environment to sustain the male, the female and their offspring. So what's the probability that they can do this, that can recreate another human offspring, but not just one time. There are over 8 billion people on the planet, so plus all those that ever existed. So what's the probability they could do this, not one time, but 14, 15 billion times, and they'd be the exact same or have, have the exact same DNA makeup, not have the exact same DNA, but have the exact same genetic makeup as other human beings. And what's the mathematical probability of them doing so, but also doing so in a suitable environment? What's the mathematical probability of that environment be suitable to sustain them, meaning give them food, give them shelter, there's enough warmth, there's enough oxygen, there's enough water. What is the mathematical probability of them being in a local uh, ecosystem that can sustain them? But then after that, though, before we get to that point, we have to think about what's the mathematical probability of this local ecosystem being contained in a greater ecosystem, you know, the region of the earth or just the earth itself. And so then that means we, before we get to that point, we have to think about what's the mathematical probability of the earth being a suitable ecosystem for not just human beings, but for other forms of life so that they can also exist. What is the mathematical probability for it to have the exact right amount of gravity, the right amount of oxygen, the right amount of heat, the right amount of cold in some places, the right amount of food, the right amount of water, What's the, what's the mathematical probability of this happening and not just being sustained for just a small portion of time, but for a long period of time? What's the mathematical probability of even this overall uh, place that we live, the planet, this ecosystem that, that our local ecosystem exists? What's the mathematical probability of the Earth being in an ecosystem that is suitable for its survival? Meaning, what's the mathematical probability of the Earth existing amongst other planets, having its own moon, having its own gravitational force, being in the right the right distance from the sun, not too close, not too far, what's the mathematical probability of it being in the right orbit, as well as the other planets being in the right orbit, not colliding or crashing into others, what's the mathematical probability of this solar system being in existence to be a suitable place for our own Earth, to also house a suitable ecosystem for all the different animals and species on the planet, including human beings that could also reproduce themselves billions of times over. What's the mathematical probability of that? And what did he come to? This mathematician came to the conclusion that it is literally impossible for it not to be God. When you sit and think about the fullness, the wonders of God, his mighty hand, and then come to a conclusion that there is no God, and to come to the conclusion that a God who exists, who wants to have a relationship with his people, will not wait until the 7th century 
to create Islam, will not wait uh, another thousand years to create any other religion. As soon as he can have a relationship, establish a relationship with his people, which we see in what the Bible speaks of. And we know that the Bible is true. If the Bible is true, then what it says in the Bible is also true. And because of these prophecies, we can bank on the fact that the Bible is true. Some people are just not going to believe. Some people don't care. Some people have made up their minds that they don't want to trust it. And the greatest reason isn't that they have a problem with even just logic, because logic dictates that if there is a God, then the different miracles that are contained and talked about in the Bible, then those are easily doable. Parting the Red Sea, Jesus walking on water, the sun and the earth standing still, there being a great flood. All of these things are without question possible if there is a God. And so if there is a God, the problem with the human beings who doesn't want to be a God is that you must conform to, you must bow down, you must worship him, you must have him to be your Lord. The problem is with most people, not that it's too hard to believe the Bible. The problem is I don't want to believe the Bible. I don't want to live my life according to God. I don't want anyone to be my Lord. I want to be in control. That is the biggest problem that people have. Because if you ask them if it's true, would they still believe if you found out, if you had conclusive proof, whatever that would be. And again, for most of them, there's no such thing for them as proof. They have said that no matter what you show me, I'm not going to believe. But if there's a person who says that, yes, there's something that you can show me, if you were to show them whatever it is they want to be shown, they still wouldn't believe. Why? Because it's not the, the proof that, that matters. It's knowing that there is a God who should be their Lord and they don't want that. And so anyone that disagrees that has a problem, fine. The problem is not with me. The problem is on you. Let me just tell you what Jesus says, and we'll leave it at that. Jesus says in John eleven twenty six, 26, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, so whoever is believing in him, will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And notice how he ends it. He says, do you believe this? So the question is going to be, with all the different objections you may come up with, with all the different facts that are stated, with all the different philosophical arguments one way or the other, the question is, do you believe this? If you believe this, then you will live. If you do not, fine. Give all the excuses that you want to, but it's you on your own. But at some point in time, at some point in time, because again, I said, if the Bible is true, then what the Bible says is true. And what does it say? At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. You don't have to believe it now, but at some point in time, you will believe it.